Hello and welcome. I am in Sweden, in Stockholm. Just arrived today for a conference that starts tomorrow, the Art of Record Production. Uh, but before the conference starts, I managed to secure an interview with Jacob Huck. Hello. Hello there. Who is here with me in Stockholm. Jacob, in my opinion, is one of the most inspiring people who have online presence, especially on YouTube. So I guess the name for this kind of activity that you conduct, is it a YouTuber or...? You could probably say that I'm a YouTuber. Okay. Um, yeah. But um, essentially, Jacob is someone who creates and has been creating frequently episodes called Hack Attacks. Hack Attack, yeah. He is making content that sounds very, very musical. When I listen to Jacob's reviews or tutorials, I just find them very inspiring musically and I can just feel like, wow, that's the music that I would love to make with those tools. So that's very unique because not everyone can make great music while reviewing products or describing them. Uh, plus, Jacob can be very entertaining and his videos are extremely well put together as well so thank you very much that's very kind of you to say so Jacob is here with me and I will just ask him about a bunch of things and let the questions roll yeah let it roll I'm, I'm really excited about this I would like to start with just finding out more about how did you start in music production which was presumably way before you started using iOS tools. So if you could just give us a bit of a background story of how it all started for you. Well, electronic music making has been something I've been into for over 25 years. And it's basically started out in a very early age when I, I, I got like a keyboard from my mother. She bought an electronic keyboard containing a Yamaha FM chip or something like that. I didn't know that back then, but I was already infatuated with the sound it produced. Later on, I got um, my first computer that was like a Commodore 64 with the old tape recorder and stuff like that. I learned how to program a little bit of BASIC, which I've forgotten completely now, but I made a, a piano and that made me interested in how I could manipulate this thing into making sounds I, I thought I wanted to make. It didn't really sound like I wanted to sound, but um, it just got me into thinking what else you could do with it. And at that age, I was already conceptualizing something that could be like handheld, that could become anything, synthesizer, drum machine, anything like that, and where I could use it like anywhere and do anything with it. From there on it went and I got um, a Windows computer and I started working with Propellerhead software stuff like Rebirth. That was my first big love. I also used something called VAS Modular. I remember the beginning of Fruit Loops when it was only a pattern sequencer, yeah. just just yeah, a pattern yeah. sequencer with buttons in it, nothing else. And I used that. Like late 90s, I guess. Yeah, yeah I think yeah, it yeah. was. Yeah. I, I played guitars. I played guitars, I played some drums, I played some piano. Didn't interest me one bit. They always sound like a guitar. They always sound like a bass, always sound like a drum kit. Sure, there are different types of guitars and basses and, and, and dr drum kits and stuff like that, and they all sound a bit different, but it's the same thing. Now, when you get into the digital side of it, it's completely different. It's electronics. Um, even analog, modular synthesizers and stuff like that, I started dabbling with that too. I started picking things apart building my own things. Before we kind of move on to the present times, just perhaps one or two more questions about your own music making process. So first of all, I wanted to ask whether you actually perform music live and whether iOS is part of that or whether you're using any other... Or maybe you don't perform at all? I, I don't perform anymore at all. So you used to perform? Uh, yeah, I have in, in many various different settings as a DJ and as a musician. Um, why I don't do now is because it doesn't interest me. It was part of my old life and I'm more interested in trying to provide people with information for making their own music. Mm -hmm. Basically, that's more interesting now. 
to answer that correctly, there's like a thing about me where I am today uh, is because I'm a sober alcoholic and, and, and uh, drug abuser. So I've been sober for four years now. And that's also how long I've been doing hack attack. Okay. I had to occupy myself also okay. when I got sober. I didn't know that, so congratulations. Thank you. Um, and this is the reason to why I am able to do this right now. It's because I'm sober. Um, so when I was out and gigging, doing gigs, I was always drunk or high. Right. I don't remember much of the gigs. I remember what people told me after the gigs. Yeah. Sometimes, like, actually playing the music always went well, okay? But afterwards and before that, not so good. Mm. Not really a fun person to be around. Because I was just always drunk and high, and I wasn't focusing on the music, I wasn't focusing on anything else. I was a jealous person. Um, I I almost hated that other people made good music, and I wish <laughs> that I had done it. I I have a I still have a huge ego, but today I'm able to actually love someone else for what they've done. And that's one of the things with Hack Attack too. Like when I started blogging, I started making these interviews and stuff um, because I wanted to highlight the people who are, who are making the tools that we are using to create music because they are my heroes. Um, and lifting other musicians for doing awesome stuff. One of my most favorite iOS musicians is Jesper Jones. He started out as a DJ and so his music is very catchy because he's been working as a DJ for a long time. Mm -hmm. He knows, he has that sense, he, he, he's better than me. He knows what people want to hear. He makes awesome stuff, he mixes everything. And so I've lifted him several times. And I've been able to do that. And I couldn't do that back in the day as a drunkard. Is he based in uh, Stockholm as well? No, no. He's, uh, he's from Göteborg. Okay. Which is also in Sweden, yeah? yeah. Gothenburg. Okay, right. Gothenburg, yeah, the, oh, other, the other big city. And the interviews that you used to have, they are not available anymore, are they? No, I've, I've been thinking of a way of making them available. Um, again, because I closed down the site because I wanted m to focus on the videos. That's where I'm strongest. Yeah, okay. I'm really strongest there. I have a, I have a reading disability and uh, and writing disability. So I always had to have my journalist girlfriend. I mean, she's she's the real journalist here. She's been teaching me about the work, like how to do it and how to interview people. And she had to go through proofreading my stuff before I could post it. And it was riddled, riddled <laughs> with faults. Right. I can't even type out SMSs without getting stuff wrong. Okay. okay. So yeah, videos is the way to go. Do you release music? in any form, such as singles, EPs or albums? The thing about like old works and, and how cringy some of it might be, there's a reason why I'm not like pointing people to really old music. Of yours? Yeah. So it exists somewhere, somewhere. but you just kind of feel like you moved on and you're concentrating on what you're doing now. Teaching. You don't feel that old releases represent you that well, basically. <laughs> they don't. <laughs> They don't. They do not represent me. I won't stand by that music. Yeah. It was an experiment into where I am today. L let me l say like this. I release new music all the time in my videos. In your videos. But you don't put it, say, on Spotify no. or Bandcamp? No. Not that. No. I, I know many people do that. Yeah. Uh, who are in a iOS... Um, like Jasper Jones. I think he releases his stuff through Optronica, the Optronica label, yeah, which uh, run by Cliff Johnston from the US. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, I was just curious about it because I could imagine that a lot of the content that you create for your YouTube channel already has so much music that maybe could be transferred into tracks that form, you know, singles or EPs. But then I'll have to stop making videos. I can't do two things at yeah. the same time. I can't. I have to focus on one thing at one time. If my viewers want me to keep making videos, then don't ask me making tracks. Because an album for me doesn't take a week or a month. I'll spend a year on it. Yeah. And that's a year without videos. Yeah. And that's why I don't do it. I really want to make the videos. I'd rather just spread the information about how to use stuff and see people make music of it. Because that's not so important to me anymore. Mm -hmm. Back in the day, 
when I was uh, that very like I had a lot of friends, but I w- I always felt lonely. Um, I always tried to take the pain away with drugs and stuff like that. I couldn't I couldn't really do anything else but focus on myself. I was selfish, and I wanted my music to be big. And you know, it's th- that's what I that's what I think of when someone asks me, "Do you release music?" That's what comes up in my head. Yeah. That ego. Yeah. I want to try to stay humble if I can. And making stuff for others, sure, it could be music. But this is more helpful because I'm helping people make music. And that's more important. Um, but if I make music today, a full track, it's in a live performance video. A full track for me is at least three minutes, okay? So if you find a four minute live performance video, then that's a track. Yeah. It's a video and a track in one but you won't find an mp3. It's visual for me too. It needs to be visual. Tracks, it just doesn't cut it for me anymore. And it's an interesting uh, point of view that there are many ways of being creative with music. It's not just that you have to be in your home studio making tracks and putting them out on you know, Bandcamp or Spotify. There are perhaps more innovative ways and perhaps you are exploring them through your creative video making process. So that's a very interesting uh, point of view, I think. My next question is about other artists that inspire you. Or not maybe just artists, could be philosophers, could be anyone really. So um, what or who inspires you? Michio Kaku. So tell us who it is. Michio Kaku <laughs> is, um, th- that's the thing. Whenever I point to him, I can't explain his title because I always forget. All I know that I think he teaches in universities about the universe. He's a string theorist and I love listening to this man walk me through what what quantum is and quantum string physics. theory and okay. physics and, and space. Also Neil deGrasse. Yeah. They try to put things as correct as possible. That's something I've learned through them. And it's also forced me to view my own work in the same way, actually checking my sources. Do I really know how this works? Do I really know what additive synthesis is? I need to like double check my facts. That's why they inspire me so much. Also, I'm really inspired by, by the world we live in and the space and everything within it and origins and stuff like that. Uh, so that's why I listen to them. But if we're talking musicians, and we're not talking about like contemporary musicians today, but from back in the day, I'm inspired by, let's say, King Tubby from Jamaica and uh, the scientists, people who made the most of what they had. Not much money. They wanted a spring reverb. They had to hook it up themselves. They had to do that. Like Lee Perry, one of the bass sounds on one of the Bob Marley albums sounds very specific, okay? And the reason why it sounds so specific is because they didn't have any whole amplifiers. They were broken, like for the bass. So he turned it around and put a mic on the background. And that's why that bass sound sounds so yummy. Like engineers who do stuff out of the box. So I have this thing, it's broken. Can I use it? I don't know, I'll try to use it. That's what I love, that inspires me. My parents inspire me too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they inspire me because they haven't had it easy and they've been doing their best. So they inspire me. I'm also inspired by, by my brother and, and his daughter, wonderful daughter, and my girlfriend. She's an awesome journalist, and she's not the regular kind of journalist you see in a, like a daily paper. So she's trying to explain science from researchers to regular people. And that she, she does a lot of fact searching and checking and, you know, needs to be correct. That's, that's inspiring to me, too. But she's always there, always checking my stuff, always giving me feedback, telling me when she thinks that maybe I did something way too complex. So some of the episodes have been changed just before I released them because she saw something that I didn't. My next question is about mobility, because a lot of the discussion on your channel is about mobile music making tools, initially apps, but increasingly you talk about hardware that can be considered mobile and also you refer to yourself I think as a mobile musician yeah more than 
iOS musician? Yeah, I am a mobile musician. Yeah. I was an iOS musician before I really got into contact with uh, teenage engineering and I started borrowing all their stuff. That was the point when I realized I really wanted more external gear back into my studio, but it had to be portable. So my question is, is mobility important when music making process is considered and why? Is there more to it than simply making music sketches on a train? So I guess, how would you argue for the importance of mobility in the music making uh, setup? I'll start by saying this. If I look at my viewers on YouTube, YouTube is telling me that most of my viewers, I've got this broad range, but it's mostly from tw year 25 up to 65. It's a very even number there. So it's older people, and especially if you think about people like us in, in 40s, and we're already engaged with things. It could be family, work, stuff like that. How much time do we have to put into sitting like we did in our 20s yeah. and really get into things? Maybe not taking a shower for two days, sitting in a damp studio with a, with a, with a cereal, box of cereals and a bit of milk in it, and then just putting out beach for 24 hours. We don't do that. So accessibility to actually getting into music project is important and it is important for me too. I don't have the patience to boot up my big studio with the tower and, and turn on everything and maybe I have to reroute this and that and I have to connect that, I have to rearrange this thing and it's just uh, the bar of getting over it and really doing something. I might just waste an hour in trying to do that and then when I want to make the music, I'm distracted. So it's not just that it's portable, but it's also more immediate. It's really immediate, especially mm. if you're carrying something around like an iPhone and you got propeller, uh, sorry, today it is Ali Hoopa. So Ali Hoopa's figure on it. Yeah. It's the first thing I do in the morning. I grab my phone, I have a piece of music in my head, and I hammer out a beat in figure. If it's uh, something I need to sing, I grab audio share as you're using right now to record me on it's so accessible isn't it mm -hmm. um, and it's immediate and I can take that and grab it and go anywhere so when during the summers when I work at my regular job I work on the train bus boat subway yes I do travel all those things in my work and sometimes I travel three hours just to get to a point. Even though I'm inside Stockholm only, it's not like I'm flying somewhere, but it's still a distance. And I get to work during that time. Get to work doing cool things. And during my lunch break, I'll sit there with my, with my cup, eating my wook, cold, of course, but with my iPhone in the other, or the iPad mini in the other hand, and hammering out some beats, doing some stuff in Gadget, rearranging some bits in Cubases, I don't, I don't have to be at home doing, like, I'll do, I've, I haven't had that feeling like, oh, I can't wait until I get home so I can start this thing. Yeah. That doesn't happen now. That's, that's one part, and that's a big part of the mobility thing. It's a great perspective, and I would love to quote you on Sunday when I'll be talking about mobile music at the conference. Be my guest. Because I think you present it in a very realistic way, which is the reality for many, many people, I think, who have other commitments and yet still want to be creative. And that's perhaps uh, one of those great opportunities to be creative when you're setup or time is limited. Can I just expand on one thing? Yeah, yeah, of, of course, yeah. yeah. Um, when, it, when it comes to the people under 25 and down, then the bar of getting into music uh, has gotten lower because we have more YouTube channels now telling you how to do stuff, big YouTubers like Andrew Huang and people like that. Um, so it's, it's easier to get into something now. But with figure, it's really easy. Like, you have scales there, so you learn the relations between notes. Sure, it's, it would be better maybe to learn on the piano all the notes, but I've never been interested in that. I've always wished I could remove the keys I don't use. I always play minor scales. Now I get to do that. <laughs> you could argue that you lose something in that because you're not learning about music theory. Well, I'm nearing 40. I'm not sad that I don't know music theory. 
I know what I hear and what I like to hear, and that's what I make. And with figure, you just put your finger or your thumb down and you start making it. The bar of getting into and interested into music making starts there. And it's so close. It's a free thing you get on the phone you already have. Accessible. Like the knowledge, the bar is, is, is gone. There is no bar. You just try it. That's what I like. And so if you're young, that's going to be your first meeting with music, maybe. On a, on a side note, you mentioned uh, that that's the first thing you do in the morning, whereas for many people, I would imagine the first thing they do is probably check their social media or check their, um, you know, whatever, email. Uh, there is a way of thinking that if you wake up and start consuming data, uh, it sets you up in the mindset of being a consumer, basically. Whereas what you described is what many advocates for creativity say, to do something simple yet creative the first thing in the morning. So I'm quite interested in hearing that that's the first thing you do because it's very low commitment. You don't need to come up with a symphony, but it's just, a, I guess... Uh, a warm up for your for your musical brain, perhaps you know. Yes, because if I do start by checking Facebook or emails, then I'll be stuck doing that for the rest of the day, and then I'm not making videos that day. Mm. I'm sitting and answering people on problems they have, issues they have, or questions they have about what to get next. So I usually don't start with that. Sometimes I decide that tomorrow I'm not going to make music, and then I don't even look at the phone. Mm. Uh, I'll still grab figure though when, <laughs> yeah I'm, yeah I just can't stay away from it moving on uh, what if anything frustrates you about uh, iOS based music making what should change be improved and what are the limitations of the iOS creative process okay so this is a deep talk topic and there were many things there you asked so let's try to I've already answered some of these questions today so we I have actually a, have a basis had a, we had a coffee before we started recording and um, we spoke briefly about a few of those frustrations yeah um, okay so one of the things that I've mentioned quite early to a developer a friend of mine actually is that something I want to change on iOS is actually piano rolls Piano rolls are a mess on iOS. Um, one of the things you don't have with a computer is that you can always see where the ends and starts of notes are when you move them and rearrange them because you're using a, mo a mouse pointer, okay, basically. You don't have a big finger in the front of it when you're, when you're at the screen. The, I mean, that's one of the things with a touchscreen is that you can touch your music and grab it in different ways. But I many times find myself when working with piano rolls in every type of piano roll editor, except from one, I think it is Nano Studio, um, that I want to lift my finger to see where I'm actually at. If I'm quantizing down to 164 or, or 132, then the spaces can get quite small. And when and I'm... I inadvertently move the ends of the notes when I want to make them longer or shorter and then when I want to fix that I accidentally tap it and I end up removing the notes so I have to replace the notes, stuff like that. It's small things. We're talking about both horizontal and vertical position so uh, one would... Lengthening or shortening notes and also when you move them knowing, up or down. Knowing which pitch you are at here yeah. as well. Nano Studio has solved that with lines. Okay. Okay, so you don't have to look at where your finger is. You're going to see with these lines where you are. That's one thing. So that's a very specific example, which yeah. is great. Uh, and very much about, I guess, the graphical user interface uh, hints for developers. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, it is very specific, but man, is it important to have that experience of using a piano roll inside a door, which many, many apps have that, even if they're not doors. I mean, take an app like Fugue Machine. You have a, it's basically a piano roll, that is, with four playheads. So, I mean, this thing is important. And I just wish that everyone would think more about that. Yeah. Yeah. So if we don't talk about specifics, right now we have two different types of apps on iOS, okay? One is the uh, inter-app standalone kind of thing. 
take uh, Propelhead's Thor, take Waldorf Knave, um, uh, Sugar Bites, uh, Cyclops, or Unique, any one of those synthesizers. It's a single thing that you load up on the screen. It, it's big and beautiful. If you, if you have a big iPad Pro like I do, otherwise it's small, still beautiful, but small. Um, but you load it once, yeah. one time. And then you have audio unit extensions. You load them up several times. Just like plugins. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there we hit a limitation of the platform. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you start loading more than four or five audio units extensions inside, for instance, Cubasis, which I love. It's an excellent app. The developer has done has, great. Developers have done a great job with it. Uh, the, the instability that comes with more than four or five audio units is horrible. So you can work with a project and you're loading and loading and loading audio units and suddenly you have nine audio units in there or 10 or 12. And then you go back to a channel and you realize that it's crashed and you didn't see it. And so you reload it and it will crash something else. So just one uh, instance of the audio unit would crash, but the main host would be still okay, yeah? Mm, so yes. Cubasis would still be running. Yes, rolling. Cubasis yeah, will be running, right, but right. the instances will crash. Okay, so you restart it. And then the first time you can't really load it. It won't load. So you have to restart it again. And then it will load it, but then it hasn't loaded the instances properly. So, so the settings would be gone. Yeah, so if you haven't saved presets, which you couldn't do in the beginning, they've changed that now. Yeah. Thank you, Steinberg, for that. But you couldn't do that. And that meant you lost your music. So it has changed somewhat. But there's a, a, a limit there, which a lot of users don't realize, that they have also hit the limit of the hardware itself. You can't load how many instances you want. You have a limitations, and th that's why I always keep bouncing my stuff, so making waveforms out of it, and unload, and then load a new instance of something else, and, and just keep w working with waveforms, because it is the safest way to work inside a doll like Cubasis or Aurea, it's like with wave waveforms. You want to load a lot of synthesizers and do it on a computer, like you do it on a computer with four quad cores, you're not going to be able to do that properly on iOS yet. I want that to change, but for that to happen, Apple has to step up their game. I have to say, it wasn't on my question list, but it's a very important topic. Uh, I have to say I'm one of those skeptics when it comes to how far the DAWs on iOS are developed, and I'm still more of a desktop DAW user, primarily with Ableton, that's my main, not a disappointment, but perceived shortcoming of the iOS platform when it comes to the power of DAWs, but that power is sometimes diminished by Apple-related lack of progress, such as you know the situation with um, how various connections between apps are facilitated. Yep. But I understand that you very successfully are using uh, iOS-based DAWs, especially Cubasis, which is your uh, weapon of choice? When I'm working with waveforms. Right, so not so much MIDI. No, well, only to, to, to a, sequence a synthesizer, right. bounce it and record it into wave. As soon as but possible. if I want to work with synthesizers, yeah. I grab Gadget. Right, okay. So that's what I do. It's a safer, more stable environment for you. Oh yes, oh yes. Okay. I mean, uh, I haven't made Gadget crash. Yeah. I haven't made Gadget crash ever. I have made it crash when I've restored in a purchases when reinstalling it uh, on a device or something. But that's the only time. And that's I think that's something Apple related. I don't think it's related to yeah. Gadget at all. I'll blame Apple for that. You can okay. have that. Uh, so essentially, the conclusion here, I guess, is that as soon as it's a self-contained doll, such as Gadget, it's a stable, safer tool, whereas those multi-connected platforms where you have various third-party developers and, say, audio unit extensions are a lot less stable and therefore more frustrating to work with. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, um, it's almost like um, when you work with... When I work with Gadget, it's like I get one finished, uh, let's say, car. But if I work with Cubasis and I want to use other stuff, it's like I'm, I'm trying to tailor my own car 
uh, and then there's a lot of pieces that has to fit together and they're made by different developers who sometimes use in different connections and stuff it, almost like that so you're out driving a car and suddenly you lose a wheel yeah. it, that might happen now I'm not saying that it's the most unstable thing ever because that would be misrepresenting what I think about Cubase is I love Cubase, I do, and uh, I'm an old Cubase owner, like user. I've used Cubase for a long time. I remember seeing Cubase one for the first time. It was only MIDI, yeah. and the classic uh, on yeah. Atari ST. Yeah, yeah. and I am. Um, I'm. A <laughs> I'm just a. You could call me a fanboy. I mean, I there sometimes there might be faults that I choose to disregard from. But if it's something like serious, I will talk about that. But usually I just wait for the people to fix it because I talk a lot to developers and I know what they're going through. And so I can understand your disappointment in the platform right now. But all I'm seeing is something still being developed. Yeah, of course. It's not, it's not done yet. I mean, if you look at uh, Cubase for desktop, one of my friends still uses this. He bought Cubase the same time as mine and he hasn't upgraded yet. Yeah. And that thing is still so so awesome and so complete. Cubasis does some things that no one else does with their automation lanes and, and slopes and stuff. It's just it's a, it's just amazing. You're not really there with iOS yet. There are some things you cannot do. But if you look at iOS and the limitations, uh, for me personally, I've made music with reel-to-reel -reel recorders, tape recorders. I mean, I've been where the limitations are some of the worst. Yeah. Overdubbing stuff. I mean, there's literally nothing I can't do with this. Yeah, so I just have to do it in steps. So, okay, I can't use 10 instances of synthesizers. I'll use one and I'll bounce it. Okay, so I can't use the biggest uh, mastering thing. Okay, so I'll do it in steps. I'll use this one for that, this one for that, and this one for that in steps instead. It can still be doable. Another good analogy that you just used, that if you put it in that kind of light, then indeed iOS is actually extremely powerful rather than limiting. And cheap, regarding the price of the actual device, mm. but I think Apple is devaluating the amount of work that goes into making apps which I think is a shitty thing and developers, especially third-party developers that doesn't have a big name behind them like let's say Steinberg or Korg or, or, or Propeller Heads or someone like that they have something to take from but if you're a new third-party developer it's not easy so seeing people like uh, Jonathan Lillidal who made the Kematic and AudioShare and ARM to see him succeed is amazing and see guys from like uh, what what they called Limit Limited Noises what what they called their Amazing Noises to see these people make these things for iOS and I know I know they they, they aren't having a, an easy way and they have they're teaching the users of the platform that it should cost nothing Everything costs something, and the price we pay is very, very low. So, sure, you could argue you cannot do everything you can do with Cubase on the desktop. Yeah, sure, but the price isn't even close. It's not even close to what you have to pay for that. So, I guess there are two sides of the price discussion. On the, on the one hand, it's great for the users, but on the other hand, it stops development because uh, developers cannot sustain their companies anymore and where's the incentive yeah where's the incentive how many developers haven't we seen just poop away mm. because they 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 lose interest or they they can't sustain themselves i guess it's a delicate balance though because we don't have piracy on ios because yeah. it's a very controlled en environment yeah um uh, but on the other hand, I've seen a developer of uh, Odulus the other day uh, thanking people who purchased uh, a lot of units of his apps uh, during the Black Friday sales. Yeah. Um, so I guess where there is volume, even if the price is low, as it was with the sales, the volume, sheer volume might be enough to deliver... Uh, the financial uh, gain, which is substantial enough, but I guess with what you're saying, and I agree with that, especially smaller developers, even if they sell for close to nothing, or 
if the price is very reasonable, the volume is still not there because they're not as popular, they're not as famous or well known. So there's an interesting discussion of, the, of this price uh, issue, which makes the iOS very unique because it is indeed very affordable. Yeah, it is. I mean, sure, you have to pay the, that, that initial price for the device itself, but if you're starting out, you could just get something older and pay less for it. Yeah. Something used or yeah. an older product that you purchase directly from a retailer or Apple or something like that. Something furbished, refurbished, you can do that if you're in the US, I think. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I do recommend doing that because oh, it's... This is a refurbished... Uh, I'm recording it on a refurbished uh, you are. iPad Air 2 uh, from Australian Apple Store. Right. So that's... Yeah, it, that, that is, is also... Awesome. Outside of the US as well. <laughs> I like that because I don't like waste. Mm. I don't like waste at all, so seeing something like this is awesome. Uh, we spoke about the DOS, like Cubasis, and I guess with the DOS, a lot of the iOS DOS try to imitate desktop versions in many ways, and there's no doubt there's a lot of innovation with uh, the iOS music making tools, but I wonder, do you see any innovation in DOS on iOS that sets it apart from the desktop in any way? Or do you think it's more like following the footsteps of what has been developed on the desktop and just trying to make it as good eventually? If you look at, if you look at Gadget, it's a bit different than most DOS. It's self-contained, it's kind of a bit like what Reason used to be in the old days, I guess. Yeah, kind of, uh, without the modular structure. Yeah, uh, without the beautiful cables and all of that. Yeah, and with all those little boxes, uh, yeah. with all the patterns in it, it kind of looks a bit like Ableton Live. I like it. That's true, the, the sequencer yeah. is a bit Yeah, I mean, like, it's yeah. nothing like Ableton Live, of course, I know that, but it kind of, with the uh, yeah, small... But you still don't use them as clips. I would say the mod step is more like a an Ableton Live kind of thing for MIDI, yeah. uh, because you launch clips on it. So it's uh, it's the best clip launcher you could use, like a MIDI thing. If you want to do everything hardware and just sequences with an iPad, you use mod step and you launch clips. So that's pretty cool. But can you see any? Uh, un so uniqueness uh, with the DOS on iOS that doesn't exist on uh, desktop uh, yet? Or is it more like less likely to happen in the DAW environment, do you think? They yeah, I think approach? it's less likely to happen in the DAW environment. Yeah, I think that we're going to see stuff being ported over from the desktop to the DAW, and it looks like they're going that way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's interesting with Gadget, though. Think about this. Gadget started on the iOS, and now it's on... On the, on, on the desktop, desktop which is uh, the other way around the first example of that being the other way around yeah is quite interesting it's pretty pretty cool pretty cool I'm interested in seeing what Korg chooses to do with this I yeah. um, I personally love I've, I've made what is it like 50 videos on my channel about Korg gadget or something I don't know I, I think it is around there I just love the product it's an awesome thing um, but innovation Innovation. It's not like I see any new functionalities, no. If you want to talk innovation, we have to talk app apps specific. I would say it's a natural innovation like TC11. TC11 by BitShape. Which I finally purchased last weekend when it was on sale. <laughs> yeah, it's an and awesome I watched, thing. I watched your video uh, before I purchased. That's the common thing, I guess. People often want to buy an app and they would go to your channel because you describe it in a lot of great detail. And you kind of sell those apps. Like when I saw your video, which was way better than the actual developer's videos, which were kind of saying things in a very generic way, your video dissected the whole background of how to make a patch or programming the sounds. It just looks awesome. When you touch it, stuff happens on the screen. And they have a purpose. And there are so many things under it, underneath the engine, that you can tie to all these controls. It, it's literally using the touch interface and the gyro to its fullest extent, but TC11. With, with TC11, if you don't program a patch uh, from scratch, I, I guess the, the challenge is that the purpose is not immediately obvious. If you use a preset, uh, so you play a patch, 
and you kind of don't quite know exactly what note you will be triggering. Yeah, the, the thing is, I think you have to throw out the conventional way of thinking when you use an app like that. It was made to be explorable. I mean, that's what I do with every patch. I explore it. Um, and when I open it up under the hood, when you go to the synthesizer section, it's just, I know it's going to sound bad, it's just a modular synthesizer. Right. Yeah. And you press there to there to make it route to one from one place to another. It's that simple. But then you open it up to all the controlling elements. It actually matters how many fingers you hold down, how far you have them apart. If you're using ten fingers or five fingers, um, you can tie all of it to envelopes, to several envelopes, several sequences. It's so deep that I couldn't even explain all of it in seven deep, deep videos. If you look at all the, the, the whole series of tutorials I've made, then you'll understand the basics of it. But if you need more than that, you can still do more than that. Yeah. I'm going to need six more videos. I'm not going to make those. Yeah. You get the basics from me, and then you'll have to take it from there. Yeah, and of course, that's, I guess, where the beauty and power of iOS really shines. You've got that traditional synthesis, but then you've got a totally unique touch. Yeah, way interface. of interacting with it. And that's where the uniqueness uh, exists. Take Propellerhead 4. It's my most favorite synthesizer of all time. It's just amazing. It looks more like a conventional modular mod synthesizer would look like. It's got knob on a touch screen. You can't really feel the knobs, right? I mean, that's weird, but it's still very usable, still very usable. But it's, is it innovative to put knobs on a touchscreen? Not really. Mm. It's not, this is not me talking down propeller heads Thor. Which was, by the way, ported from, from the desktop to start with. So yes, guess, it was yeah. ported from the desktop. Yeah. So, it, yeah, it, it looks like it looks on desktop. And, yeah. and on desktop, same thing. You don't have hardware knobs there. To actually feel what you're touching, you have to, to control it with a, with a, with a MIDI controller. Mm. And so I've got several MIDI controllers. That's the thing. When you get an iPad, you usually don't end up with one MIDI controller. You have several. With the computer, you get that one big MIDI controller. So you are more happy using apps with MIDI controllers rather than just the touchscreen interface all the way? It depends on what you're, what you're giving me. <laughs> but in terms of like uh, manipulating parameters, not so much playing the keyboard, but say manipulating parameters, the knobs and the faders, sliders. Ah, oh, that's interesting because with Propeller Heads Thor, it has a very interesting, neat feature. So when you touch a knob and put, hold down and, and drag it out to control it, then you actually get a rubber band and you get a scaling. When you pull your finger far away from the knob, that scale gets bigger. So you're, you're able to fine tune in a different way. You're ha you actually have a visual representation. You don't have to look at the knob. You don't have to fiddle with small areas. You can, do, you can use your whole screen area. That's innovative. Okay. That's innovative. Right. So in that case, I don't need hardware knobs. I don't need a MIDI controller. But with something like Cyclops from Sugarbytes, you really want a MIDI controller. Which is also, also ported from the desktop, yes. but badly, I guess, yeah? Uh, or not, not, as, not, I'm as, not I am not going to say that it okay. was badly ported, but I, I, I urge anyone to try out Cyclops from Sugarbytes on an iPad mini. And you know what I mean. So I have an iPad Pro now, and that's why I made my first video, even though Cyclops has been out for several years on iOS, I made my first video, uh, like the beginning of this week, I think, <laughs> or on Sunday for it. That was the first video I made, because I now have a big screen to actually show that beast, that monster of a synth. So it's a lot more usable on the big screen. Yes, it is. It's amazing. And I, the developers know it. Yeah, yeah. Which are very, very, in, very awesome people, by the way. Oh, excellent. Because we spoke previously that you are in the lucky position being based in Stockholm. You have in your neighborhood developers such as Propellerheads or Teenage Engineering. Are there any other developers here? Clev Gern Produkon. Clev Yeah. Okay. Uh, Johan Sundhage and the guys are sitting 25 minutes away from here. Right. Propellerheads, I were there earlier today. Um, 30 minutes from here, 25 minutes from here. And then 25 minutes up that way. Um, I'm pointing, so you listening to this podcast can't see this, but you, uh, you got Teenage Engineering. I was there meeting up with Tobias today. 
Um, you also have Oxy in in Gamla oh, Stan. Okay. Um, you've got several developers around here, and you have the guys from uh, uh, from uh, what uh, that made Microtonic and Synth Plant, uh, Sonic Charge. These guys are also living here. They're based here in Sweden. Um, I mean, almost everyone is in Stockholm except from Jonathan Lilledal. He's somewhere else. I'm not going to disclose his position. Oh, but he's uh, originally uh, based in Sweden as well. Yeah, yeah I think. He is from these areas, okay, somewhere right. outside Stockholm. Wow. I think from the beginning. So he's been at M Studio, where I've been a lot too. He's been in Stockholm a lot. Then you have so the the only non-Stockholm company is Electron, and they're back down in Gothenburg, Which where Jasper right. Jones lives. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So Sweden is obviously a powerhouse when it comes to innovative. Oh yeah, music we're making. we're banging we're banging it over here. We're banging it over here when it comes to both music, electronic music, and and when it comes to apps and stuff like that. That's yeah. Amazing. Apps Absolutely, it's an amazing, amazing country to be in. Wow, that's that's so fascinating to hear because you know of those companies in Australia. Obviously, those are very well established uh, entities. But yeah, it's so fascinating to know that you know you just came back from a meeting with uh, propeller heads. Uh, which is you know, like right. right I, I just want to get this on record. I wish that Novation would open up an office here because I love those guys. I've, I've had a lot of contact with them. They're amazing. So a big shout out to these guys over uh, in London. Are you using? Uh, well, I know you're using the Novation synthesizer, Mini Nova. Yeah. yeah oh, what what a beast! What a monster! And are you using uh, their groove box as well? The, uh, the, the circuit? No, I no, I I haven't been able to afford one yet. But if I would have, if I could afford it, you can bet your ass on I would get one. The, the reason I'm asking is because it would fit into that mobile category, I guess. But it, I think it's not it's not able to battery power it through it, a USB battery, right? No, it's it can be battery powered with no need for uh, bus power from the USB. Is it? Yeah. yeah. Have I missed that completely? It's uh, it's totally battery powered. USB could be used to transfer uh, data between the computer. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, yeah. What I love about the Mini Nova is that you can take a USB battery, yeah, and plug it to the USB port. Okay. And then you can power it like that. Yeah, yeah, like a MIDI controller would. For almost yeah, right. two days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for almost two days. So that that's that's just amazing. I, I, I I'm gonna bring my Mini Nova with me a lot now, okay. and I'm gonna get another USB battery pack for for the iPad because the iPad it just eats batteries. Yeah, it and consumes them. That's a separate story, but yeah, yeah, I've noticed that with new operating system updates, my battery is not as good as it used to be. Next question, then. Yeah. Um, we spoke a little bit about various limitations, but. It's quite obvious that some limitations enhance creativity mm. because you're more focused, you can do things in new ways because of the limitations. But can you think of some specific iOS limitations that enhance creativity? I would I would absolutely say the hardware itself. I mean, the year is 2017, okay? Soon going to turn to 2018. And I'm still bouncing my tracks because I don't have enough memory to storage my waves that I need to access immediately, not enough random memory access. I mean, come on. So that limitation... Forces you to commit. Yes, completely. Yeah. Yeah. So I have to make sure that every time I bounce something, it's exactly right. So let's yeah. say I'm using something like the Chord Money Poly and I want to record that. Now, it's made to sound like an analog type synthesizer. What do they do? They drift. In pitch, that's what the oscillators do because real ones are alive within cit like citation marks. Are they? Quotation marks? What do you say? Uh, quotation marks. Yeah. Like citation is when you cite from someone else. Yeah, quotation marks. Yeah. It's 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 a real thing, living thing. Uh, it's not that I think it's more real than a digital synthesizer, but it's controlled by by analog signals, by con condensers and and resistance and voltage and stuff like that. So they drift. So they make the software sound like that. So they make it drift on purpose. So when I want to record something like that and bounce that, a loop, I have to play through it several times and record it in real time until I get that right spot. And it might not happen right away. I might have to stop the track and play again and then stop play, stop play, stop play. Now it sounds right. Now I'm going to record it. Oh, I lost it. I'm going to do it again. So yeah, you have to commit. 
Yeah, that's a, an interesting... But you do that on a, on desktop too. I know some people do. To commit... Uh, yeah, by printing uh, MIDI to audio, of course. Yeah, yeah but on iOS you kind of have to. Because yeah. as soon as you're running seven apps, synthesizers, even with the newest form of, of the iPad, you're going to run into troubles as soon as you start adding compressors, equalizers gates and other things that you need for your music production and then it's better to have it into wave so that little box makes me become more creative and and also uh, if if i don't have any more space in a project how do i add more equal eq mm -hmm. i'll export it open up a new project process it there and bring it back in again yeah. and as long as you have problems to solve you're never bored that's the most dangerous thing about creativity. Creativity is also about solving problems. I mean, even a, an empty canvas for a painter is a problem. It's a problem you have to solve. You have to do something with it. You have to fix it. And if you limit the colors you use, you have to be even more creative in the way you mix them. Same with the audio tools. Okay, so you don't have isotopes, ozone to master your stuff. How can you do it with the tools you have? Those limitations. And like even what you mentioned before about core gadget, which is stable and yet it's limited because it's self-contained. It doesn't allow you to inject other plugins into it, and yet uh, that limitation leads to very creative um, outcomes. Again, exactly. Um, one of the limitations of gadget was that I wanted to use it live. You're right. I solved that with another app called Croft, K-R-F-T, yeah. by, by um, oh my, oh my god, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, British developer, Am, Am, Studio, Studio S Amplify, that's right, good memory, awesome guys, two brothers, um, yeah, very responsive, oh yeah, uh, yeah, I was about to play a gig in Australia, and I was telling them how much I would love uh, I think back then it was Ableton Link. It was in a, at an early stage of the app development. Yeah. And they were saying, yes, we are, we are working on that. And they just made it before I played that gig. It was, it was just amazing. They were just keen to implement so much feedback. And yeah, you, you've done that great in-depth video on that app uh, with, again, some great music. So highly recommend that if you want to learn more about Craft, uh, the app. Now, we spoke about that to a degree, but again, what are the best, most important and helpful aspects of iOS music making, if there is anything that we haven't discussed? If you look at the app market, it's very saturated today, right? Right? It's not that new. We have loads of synthesizers and stuff, but there are still some developers out there that manage to do new things. Like TC11, for example. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And that one is old. But then you have another old one, Borderlands Granular. Yeah. It's an amazing piece of granular artwork. It's just, it's just, it's sick how good it is. Um, and this is the thing I'm still waiting on. I don't see that on desktop. Take Sonic Charge. Have you seen Synth Plant? I haven't used it, no. It looks like a plant, like a root system. Okay. It's not a new uh, new right. thing, but I want to see these things happen. So I want to see the new, new TC11. I'm not, I don't think I'm going to see that on desktop, yeah. but I do think I will be able to see it on, 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 on iOS for quite some time. I, there's going to be some stuff coming. It is saturated with regular synthesizers. Yeah. Uh, it is saturated with drum machines and everything. But then again, you find people doing these weird things like seek beats and um, el elastic drums and patterning, which got a circular. Yeah, yeah it, I mean, there's a lot of things happening there that I find interesting. Orpheon is another interesting thing. Um, it's just there are so many interesting apps coming out. So even though most of the apps looks like regular, more conventional stuff you can find on iOS and even in the real world, uh, there are some golden opportunities out there. So in that form, if you think about apps, an app is old in a year, okay, in app years, then it's old. When, when you make an app and you put it out, 
you have a window of up to three weeks to sell as much as you can. After that, there's no interest anymore. You see it dropping off. Everyone tells me this. So you have the most sales in the first two weeks. It's quite an, a good insight from you to even disclose that because I didn't realize it's such a short window. Um, and I can't tell you what source that came from. So this one, you'll have to take my word and everyone else yeah. listening, but you have that window. So the thing is, the thing is, if you look at an, an electron drum machine, do you think it has a three week window interest? No, it will still be relevant next year. So with apps, it's a very, very short attention span, very small prices, and you can get anything whenever you want. So you buy a lot of stuff. Do you use it all? Probably not. I do because I have to, but I will be no hypocrite here. If I didn't make reviews, I would be as anyone else out there. So if you're listening to me, I'm just like you. I'll buy anything and I won't use all of it. I would like us to touch upon the workflow of iOS music making. And there are various workflows depending on what ecosystems you are using or what apps. Sometimes the workflows could be about um, how the apps are interconnected, of course, you know, with AudioBuzz, for example, or uh, AUM and various formats and all of that. But my question is, which aspects of iOS music making workflow do you find most important or helpful in getting great musical outcomes? When I begin a track, I first have to hammer out a very basic thing, like a loop, four bars, eight bars loop, of the thing I have in my head, because I wake up with music. I don't experiment until I have music. So would it be like a hook? For yes, okay. a hook. It would contain at least a bass and lead or chord and drums, and then maybe some vocal stuff on it. But at least those three things, drums, bass and lead, so figure is the first thing I use. It has to be accessible, so I use that first. And then I have to decide on where to go with this. So what workflow should I use for this? Am I gonna keep working with these figure sounds? Then I need to export them into my main DAW for audio, Cubasis. And so then I have to be able to have an opening command so I can send it anywhere. I mostly use AudioShare to, to store and, and arrange my stuff into folders because it's one of the best ones for that. Um, so, so being able to have a good filing system, which has been lacking before iOS 11 came out now then, uh, which I haven't updated to. Me neither, so I know nothing about the new filing system. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't. I've just seen pictures and um, when I met up with the people at Propeller, they said, Jacob, please try it out. <laughs> Maybe use your, your um, iPad Mini 2 because that's not your main iPad. Just use that and try it out because it's really good. You might like that. So that's the thing I've been lacking like on iOS. Good filing system, not having an open file system. So I've used AudioShare. So that solved it for me. That's an important thing to be able to move my things around since I'm not working on a desktop where everything is inside one DAW. I'm actually using multiple things here. Figure in one instance, then audio share and then Cubasis. Being able to move my files freely is most important. So audio share has been important for iOS music and many iOS musicians would say the same. And uh, I know there's a big debate out there but are you more of a Audio bus or AUM? Audio bus. Audio bus. I don't use AUM. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's your other hub, I would imagine, for connecting things together. When I do stuff internally on the iPad, yes, I use Audio bus yeah. as much as I can to port my stuff. Yeah. And uh, the nice thing with Audio bus three three is that it's so very very compatible with Cubasis right. too, uh, because um, <laughs> you open up. If you open up um, like uh, input ports or output ports, they will all open up inside Cubasis, so you have multi-channel tracking. Come on, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, I too, I think you can do that in multi-track DAW too. That will also do that. Yeah. Um, so that's pretty awesome. Being able to record several instruments at once on different channels. Haven't been able to do that much. Mm -hmm. How important? are to you the various online communities of practice, for example, the iPad Musician Facebook group? The iPad Musicians group on Facebook, which is one of the best ones, and if you're an iOS musician and you haven't found that group, join up if you have a Facebook account. 
uh, because it's really good. Um, got many members now. It's mm. growing, um, and um, I use that group now to, of course, to promote myself in a weekly thread that I have. I put all my posts into that thread, but I always use that to go and check to see what people might have issues with. It's a good way to get ideas for you. get ideas for okay. videos to make because if if I see something being asked frequently, <laughs> then I have a topic yeah. to make a video on, and I can show you how something works. Uh, so that's what I use it mostly for, and sometimes I use it to uh, just answer questions and help people out with problems they have. Um, Audio Bus Forum, uh, same thing. I check all the conversations people have. Uh, and then see if I get an idea for something or if the, some video is needed. Uh, if a video has already been made uh, about it, then I'll just go find something else. But usually I, 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 I try to find topics to answer, to try to be helpful in some way and post my own stuff there, uh, which I must say thank you to the Audiobus uh, moderator, moderators because they allowed me to post stuff there very often. And they never ever flagged me as spam or anything like that. So, yeah, that was amazing um, so they, by them. <laughs> yeah, And uh, also thanks to Linda Quinemoon, who also runs the iPad Musician Group on Facebook. Yeah, she's done an excellent job over the years, and she's still doing it. And she's allowed me to have that weekly thread there for a long time. So that's amazing. Do you find YouTube very useful in terms of engaging in a discussion, or is it... Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. but it mostly, the most, the biggest, the biggest uh, questions and discussions I get aren't through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or any other place, or even YouTube. It's actually through emails. Okay, so you publish your email as well. People can find your email easily. Yeah, yes, yes. Oh, okay. You can find it on YouTube nowadays. Oh, okay, right, Before right. that, you could only find it at my business page. And you don't find it overwhelming in terms of like uh, getting... It is overwhelming. And you still want to publish your email? Yeah, I I feel like that, that would be such a barrier to go through when you found a channel you like and you want to get in contact with that person. The worst thing I know is finding out that that person isn't reachable in any way, has chosen not to answer comments and stuff like that. I don't want to do that to my viewers, so I've, that's why I decided to publish my email. <laughs> and, and, and it's been interesting because I do get, sometimes I get a lot of critique, uh, constructive criticism. About, and I've used that uh, over okay. the years. How about your content? Okay. Yeah, I want to. I want to give a shout out to Perry, one of my most. Uh, <laughs> he's given me a lot of critique over the years, and he's helped me yeah. shape my stuff into the better. Better. So I want to thank him for that. Perry is awesome. Oh, um, but but I do get a lot of emails, and sometimes I really don't have time to answer them. I don't because I have to get the videos out. I can imagine that would be difficult to answer every single one of the emails or even Facebook comments that would be probably quite verging on impossible. Yeah. So my next one is about your wish list for mobile music making tools. What should the future hold? What would be really amazing to get, let's like say, I don't know, in five five years for example. We're talking where, should, where should we be with the iOS in the ideal world? With the iOS or mobile touch screen based music making? Because maybe one day, you know, it would be more competition in the field. I'm hoping there will be more competition in the field because I'd hate to see um, just one company reduce the iPad to a thin piece of, uh, of plastic where there are no ports and still buggy Bluetooth and stuff. I mean, I want to see that being stable. If you're going to remove jacks and ports and headphone ports here and there which I don't like right now but then you have to you have to put something else there that works just as good and at this stage uh, I don't I don't think it does because without sounding overly dramatic who knows maybe we have reached the golden era and the peak of uh, iOS because maybe from now on what Apple is doing indicates that it's a downhill ride. Like, you know, if the next generation of iPads will have no mini jack ports, may, maybe it's really indicating that things will worsen rather than improve. It's indicating that it's worsening, yes, but is it the peak? 
No, I would just say that Apple is uh, not even trying to go to the peak. <laughs> That's not their interest. Their interest is in consumers consuming their products. Mm. I don't think I don't think I'm simplifying it. But enough. those consumers, I guess, from Apple's point of view, are not necessarily musicians. No, no, no. I think that we are a very small market. Mm. If you if you look at uh, like selling units and and and, and in, in the forms of what we would be worth worth to Apple in the forms of money, monetary wise, I don't think we're that much on the scale. Um, I think you'll have much more interest in people buying uh, the latest iPhone because it's got this latest thing or you can have these latest filters for these latest apps for iOS 13.85 or whatever it is. Yeah, it's thin, it's, uh, it takes amazing photos, but it's not really a useful thing for musicians. No, it's not really... No. Not, not as useful as it could be, I should yeah, say. Yeah, exactly, yeah. E- exactly. I mean, because the, the same developers making these tools that are so easy to use and filters for this and that and, mm-hmm. you know, just to make some fun stuff, they're the same developers have the same skill sets for making the most, most amazing things like Luma Fusion, like, like, like a lot of these apps. So I don't think we've peaked it. I don't. I think we're saturated with stuff, the same stuff over and over again. And I'm starting to see this trend of people just porting over stuff that used to be hardware into software. So it's the same deal as we had on desktop. Mm-hmm. Do I hate it? No. I, I mean, who doesn't want to court poly money <laughs> on their iPad? I mean, come on. That's yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. So do I like it? Yeah, yeah. But I I still want to see these new innovations. And if you are going to remove ports, please replace it with something stable. Don't make crappy Bluetooth with crappy headphones that you'll have to charge every four hours. It's just stupid. I'm a musician. I use my headphones all the time. So I use wired ones. I don't need to power those. It's so, uh, it just feels stupid. It, it's misplaced. It's like going back in time, almost. Why, as a musician, w- would I have to abort everything I do just because my headphones ran out of juice? If I'm, if I'm going to buy a new unit, then I want to be able to use it professionally. I want to be able to connect my gear to it. And if there are no ports, there should be a system that is stable. And Bluetooth isn't stable in my experience. I don't care what people say that, hey, this is working for me. Yeah, that's not working for me. Yeah, you're going to get conflicting reports. My experience is it doesn't work all the time and it doesn't work most of the time also. It's just not good enough. No, so what I want to see in the future is a stable something that, that maybe not Bluetooth, maybe something else, I don't know, but something stable in that way. Um, I want to see the latency issues get solved with that also because if we're going to do wireless stuff it needs to be stable and I want to see the iPad being able to handle more than one sound device at a time sound interface so potentially more ports yeah so we can do more of that stuff multi-tracking from the outside into the iPad that's what I want to see so perhaps uh, the iPad Pro could be more than just a an iPad Air 3, <laughs> yeah. basically, which is uh, just improvements of the existing concept rather than really an addition of something that hasn't been implemented before. No, I, I think that the models that Apple, they, they released so many models the same year, and the differences between them is just, I call it lazy, it's just lazy money grabbing. Yeah. So it, it's, it's almost as you, you make a car in two models and then you release that car in and now in a gold color and a silver color you make it you make people pay more for it and then what 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 improvements have you made not not really you don't make any improvements you make it run one kilometer faster in the hour or something like that it feels like that lazy mm. i just why why not make one unit work for longer and then work better or more and harder on the next one that's the environmental concern as well that the constant, I guess, drive to get rid of those precious, um, expensive hardware devices and replace them with just slightly updated ones. From the business point of view, it's obvious what drives it, but from the environmental or even consumer satisfaction 
point of view, this is hugely uh, disappointing. And, you know, the annual upgrades cycle with ridiculous cosmetic changes. I mean, I'm only going to get something new if it's going to add something real tangible for me. Mm. And a new color and just a new processor when everything else is the same, yeah. it's n I'm not going to notice much mm. difference. I'm going to notice a difference if I go from an iPad mini 2 yeah. to an iPad Air or something. Yeah. I'm going to notice the difference, but not between my Pro and the new Pro or whatever. Yeah. So I just think it's lazy. Mm. Lazy and a waste of resource. Personally, I don't separate business from the environment. I mean, it's all resources. We live on a big hunk of resources. Mm. And so if we're making money, it means we're using resources. Yeah. Economics should be environmental also. Well, at least the future-proof economics, I guess. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't often talk about politics, but I'm. I'm very. I'm very scared of 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 just getting into that mindset where I just consume and change and throw away and stuff like that. So I try to use what I have as much as I can, mm -hmm. and if I can't use something, I make sure I give it to someone who can use it. There is a growing movement, and I think people with your skills, people who know how to, say solder things for example or just build things from scratch are perfect people to be able to actually do what we are very much forgetting to do which is how to repair things yeah not just dispose of them uh, but you know in the past when a radio or tv would break you would take it to a repair workshop and you would repair that radio or tv and you would keep on using it yeah nowadays when something i'm just sitting in front of a flat screen TV, yeah. if something like that breaks, it ends up uh, you know, on a rubbish uh, pile. No one even attempts to repair it. So. Yeah, and that's kind of a problem with the newer, like let, let's say iPhone 7, I, I haven't confirmed this yet, but I read somewhere that the screen is glued with the glass. Mm. So if the glass breaks, you have to switch all of it out? Well, maybe, maybe that's another thing that the future could hold, which is more modular, upgradable, uh, design, a bit like what we used to have, say, six or seven years ago with MacBook Pros, where you could upgrade RAM, upgrade hard drives into solid-state drives, and it could be perfectly possible with iPads or even iPhones if the company that makes them would allow that. But of course, that's probably not a good business model. <laughs> Uh, well, it for, depends. For well, maybe it, it is. Yeah, may if you're smart about it. Yeah, yeah if, if you have to pay out of your bum for every part, mm. like, I think they could even make more money off it than... As, <laughs> you, you might be right, as, yeah. as they do with the dongles. My potentially last question is not about iOS anymore, <laughs> because we spoke a lot about iOS music, but when it comes to other mobile music making tools, what current technologies do you find innovative? <laughs> pocket operators. So pocket operators? <laughs> yes. What's so special about them in your opinion? Firstly, affordable. Secondly, easy to use, really accessible. Um, and they sound good and they're fun to work with. Mm -hmm. There's not a big learning curve mm -hmm. and you can actually do a lot with them. Each of the units is like a small groove box mm -hmm. with drums and sounds, whatever it might be, depending on what model it is. So I think Teenage Engineering is doing some really interesting thing there. Now, the latest thing they did with the PO32, it's not innovative. It is nothing new, but it it is interesting the way you can transfer sounds that you make with something you have on a desktop a computer, like the Microtronic drum machine, and then transfer that via something that sounds like an old modem signal right into the PO32, okay. and it reproduces the sounds one to one, which is awesome, because the PO32 is actually running a Microtronic engine inside of it. So it's a collaboration between Sonic Charge and Teenage Engineering. Uh, that's interesting. I'm interested to see what that happens in the future. Another technology, I don't find it innovative, but accessible is like the Korg Volkas. Yeah. Um, so, again, very portable, quite affordable. Yes. Uh, modular, if you want them yep. to be. So, they, they do share a lot of similarities with uh, the PO family of gadgets. Yeah. Because they belong to kind of one concept. Um, yeah, you're right. Uh, and I, I, I've even seen those things 
uh, at the shelves home, ho- at homes where professional in industry people are living like people working in the music industry yeah. and you come home to them and you find that little Volca bass or uh, Volca FM standing there yeah. it's like they couldn't they couldn't stay away from it it's yeah. just too tasty you know it's too too much fun battery powered you can grab it anywhere I've been sitting on on a bus with my bass it's just it's lovely and the learning curve for actually getting into synthesis is not that it's a floor. It's a floor level. You can just... It's like walking into a room. Just grab a knob and start using it. Awesome. It definitely is an appealing concept. The label I'm involved uh, in, in Australia called Clan Analog just released an album made uh, exclusively on Volcas. Oh, lovely. Full album. So people, I think, are attracted to those limitations uh, um, because it is a limitation, uh, creatively speaking. Like You limit yourself to, say... Like with PO 32s, you could probably just make music with a bunch of them and nothing else. Yeah, I have. Yeah, and I have the videos to prove it. Yeah. So the, I, it's just it's just very affordable and usable. And when you have an iPad with that or an iPhone, then you only need some way of storing bits and pieces you make with them to make more. And then you could just grab something free like Blocks Wave. From uh, studio, from from Amp- Amplify, they call themselves today. It used to be Novation, but it's Amplify now. Yeah. Um, and just grab that or Loopy, for instance. That's a well-known app. Yeah. Uh, there's so much more you can do with it. Or as me, just record it straight into either the Zirish gadget inside Core Gadget, or you could just send it to Cubasis or maybe Aurea or some other kind of DAW you want to use. You can sync it up all with the Korg's sync control using your iPhone, sending a click track out from the headphone port into the PO32 or any pocket operator and then port that along into the Volca and suddenly you have an Ableton Link synced system using a click track. The possibilities are just endless. So as soon as you get one of those units, if you get hooked, you are going to get more and then you're going to get more and more and you're you're going to be there you know you're just you're turning into a machinist a musician yeah the never ending <laughs> never ending i guess uh, mix of creativity with technicalities yeah but that's the reality of electronic music making i guess and on that note um well those are the questions for today so thanks very much for participating in the interview so so great to meet you here in sweden in stockholm and um thank you very much for providing us all the great content uh, through your channel and various other previous engagements that you had with the sound test room a project and your blog so um, i know it's a very time consuming uh process for you to be so active and I know there's a lot more to come from you, so we will definitely stay tuned. Any um, parting words from you? It was awesome meeting you, Martin. Uh, we're at the Clarion Hotel, by the way, if you didn't know that. that was, <laughs> so we're sitting inside a, a hotel room now, and it's a, it's a lovely room, by the way. Um, no, it was great. I was really looking forward to coming here. Uh, I love interviews. I love making them myself, but uh, like interviewing others. But being interviewed, that's, uh, that's fun. Because I got a big ego and I like talking, so I got to do that. Oh yeah. no, it's it was great to get your pearls of wisdom, and there was quite a lot of them. So, thank, thank you. you so much, and uh, I wish everyone um, a very productive <laughs> week, and uh, that they finger their stuff a lot. That's something I always say. And that's a classic Jacob here for you, and I was uh, hearing it live for the first time. <laughs> great, <laughs> thanks, kids. Thank you.